Well, were you doing your Bible reading this week? Yep. Was it a little tough? Was it a little tough to read, Terry? Oh, my goodness. We were looking forward to getting out of Jeremiah to be hit with lamentations. Yeah, it was a bit tough. But uh, so we did some from Lamentations and Ezekiel, from Philemon and Hebrews this week. And uh, I really would like to just preach from the book of Hebrews this morning and call it good. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, mostly because part of Lamentations stuck with me through the whole week. I just, I couldn't escape the thoughts that it brought to my mind. And since we have decided to dwell on these passages, the prophetic messages, as well as the letters of the New Testament to allow God's Word to speak to our hearts and to transform us as we finish this year and reading through the entire Bible, I think it's important that we look at a couple of passages and see what God can bring to us, find some connections, a thread that I think runs through them. First, I want to ask, did you notice the call of Ezekiel? It's a little bit different. Uh, I read a, a scholar this week. I don't know how scholarly he is, but his, one of his thoughts stuck with me. He suggests that Ezekiel was 13 years old when he's called. 13. That thought overwhelmed me. A 13-year-old boy called to be a prophet of God, to be sent into exile to Babylon, to prophetically live out the punishment of God against the people of Judah and Israel and Jerusalem and to speak to them their entire captivity, the 70 years. That's rough. I love the scene, though, in chapter 2 where Ezekiel is told to eat the scroll. Did you read that part? He's told in chapter 2 that the, on the scroll were words that were written. They were words of lament and of mourning and of woe. And I didn't like reading Lamentations. I didn't enjoy it. It was bitter. But in Ezekiel chapter 3, as that chapter begins, this is what we read. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll, then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you, and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. I have to pause there. Words of lament and mourning and woe that tasted sweet. That seems so strange to me because I didn't enjoy reading Lamentations. But I reflected again on Lamentations, these words, and I did find something there that made me feel better. It was both bitter and sweet at the same time, and so I let it stick with me for the entire week as I went back to it. So I say my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It would seem that at different times in our lives, in different moments, we need to be reminded again of the bitterness of sin and the hardships that it brings. And we need again to remember the hurt and the pain seen in our world. I don't really like to think about it. I just really don't like it. Too much bitterness. But I thought of it 
as I was driving and I saw a woman on the side of the road. She looked very beaten down by life, and her face told a story of hardship. I don't really know her story. I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her. But I'm afraid that her story might be one I've grown too accustomed to, too familiar in our world. Poverty, drug addiction, suffering, loss, pain, death, loneliness, despair. And I had two thoughts run through my head at almost the same moment. Why is the world like this? And then another thought. How much this must hurt God. And that's where I started to cry. Because of the condition of this woman, my heart immediately imagined God, the God we've been reading about speaking through the prophets. My heart imagined God watching his daughter, his beautiful daughter. That's the way God speaks in the prophets and calls Zion his daughter. This beautiful city that we have read about that has been in despair, suffering, turmoil, anguish, pain. And God says, my daughter Zion. How much he must love. Here is his creation. Meant to shine like the stars in the heavens. To reveal his glory. But covered in the muck and mire of the grave. Suffering broken and in need of a savior how precious that woman is to god and i thought of an often neglected letter to a man named philemon and i want you to listen to the words from philemon for just a moment but not as a letter to philemon i want you to listen as a message from god to you The one who is free, you are free. I want you to hear and I want you to see your brother, the slave of sin. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. I thought of those words as the face of the woman ran through my mind again. And then I thought of some imagery from Lamentations, from Jeremiah, and from Ezekiel. This image appears in all three. My sins have been bound into a yoke. By his hands they were woven together. They have come upon my neck, and the Lord has sapped my strength. He has handed me over to those I cannot withstand. It is too easy for me to think of the sin in our world as a punishment from God. It's too easy. 
as if he's letting rain, uh, raining down disaster and hardship on people. And while Jeremiah and Ezekiel clearly show us that God pronounces judgment, I could not shake the thought as I reflected on the text that we've read the last several weeks that Israel, Judah, Jerusalem sowed their own destruction. That in effect, they built their own prison. Or as the Proverbs reminded us this week, some of those Proverbs are awful pithy. They dug a pit and then fell into it. People do that too. We each sow destruction. Sometimes we reap it, we reap it ourselves, but all too often someone else sows destruction that we receive. And how God must hate it all. If you pause there and think for just a moment, how God must hate it all with a level of hatred and anger that I cannot imagine. As he looks and he sees the creatures he made in love. He made them in love and they're living in death and destruction. Sin is tearing them apart from the inside out. If I wait there very long, the book of Lamentations and Jeremiah and Ezekiel begin to speak to me a lot more. How God must hate the condition we are in. As only a father can hate the condition that he sees his children in. And if it were not for the hope of getting to Hebrews, I, I held on to it all week. We're going to get to Hebrews. And I'm going to get to read about my Savior again. And I'm going to be reminded of what I believe and so I held on to hope so I could get to Hebrews and read this passage. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God says, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your th throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? I had to read all of chapter 1 and get into chapter 2 of Hebrews. Because the entire focus is on Jesus. Where are you looking? the question that stuck in my mind. Where are you looking for your hope? 
Are you looking in yourself? What you can do? What control you have? Are you looking in the world? My hope will not come on Tuesday. It will not. It will change nothing. My hope is in Jesus alone. And I wanted to get here all week because the bitterness and the gall is easy to hold on to. The story of sin and destruction and death in the world is easy to see. We could just take turns scrolling through the news feeds on our phone and find the sin and death and destruction and how God must hate it all. He hates it with a level of hate and anger I cannot imagine. And so he sent his son. He does not speak to us through a prophet. He speaks to us through the very word of his son. He speaks to us through his own radiance. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. You and I were meant to shine, but we were meant to reflect his glory, the glory of Jesus Christ, not our own. Can you see a thread of hope that God has sown in his story of redemption and love? The world is full of sin and death. It is. And humanity, when I look at it, does not reflect the glory of God. Not the way we were meant to. Sometimes I see it. I see it really clearly when Rosie claps her hands on the stage and sings a song. She shines. When a child says, I know the memory verse, they shine. When they give you a hug, even though you're a little bit weird. I see the glory of God in humanity sometimes. But most of the time, it's easy to lament the condition of our world. You and I were meant to shine, to reflect the glory of the sun. And I want you to pause for just a moment. And I want you to remember. Can you remember the grace and the mercy that God has sent you in Jesus? Can you remember it? Do you remember running to it, taking hold of it, and holding on to it for dear life? It was the only thing you needed. In fact, it was everything you needed. Can you remember the salvation? How good it is to wait on the salvation of the Lord. That was the hope that Jeremiah had when he wrote those words, that he believed it would come to pass. He believed God would keep his promise. And do you remember when he kept his promise to you? I know you're not home yet. That is easy to see. You're not home yet. But can you close your eyes and remember that God forgives your sin? That Jesus died on the cross for you? That he rose from the dead and you will not stay dead? Do you remember the grace and mercy that God offered you through Jesus? Then, then Paul writes this little letter to Philemon. I'm so glad this letter made it into the canon. It probably revolutionized our world. Onesimus is a slave, but he belongs to Jesus. So you have to greet him as a brother not your former slave. Can you be Philemon? Can you let go of the hurt that someone gave you? The destruction they tried to sow? That seems like a lot to ask. I won't say this. I'll let Paul say it. Although I could demand it in Christ. That's what he says. It's too hard. Does Paul understand what he's asking us to do? To let go of hurt and heartache when no resolution has been... Does he understand? 
And I don't even want to tell you the words that I read to one of my classes this week. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Oh, please don't mention that one. There is a lot of brokenness and hurt in our world, isn't there? And we pass it around like a disease. And we all walk home filthy and covered in muck and mire and death. Can you be Philemon and let your brother go? Can you set him free? You see, I don't think the power of salvation, the healing of God to our world through Jesus can come unless we release it. I think it's bound up in me. It's like a yoke that has been wrapped and it's on me. And I feel it. And I don't want to forgive sometimes. I don't want to sacrifice sometimes. I don't want to help sometimes. But then do I remember the salvation of God through Jesus? What I have already received? And, and beyond that, what I long to take hold of? The glory of the resurrection caught up in Christ, dwelling with God forever? And can I see the condition of the world around me? And can I learn to hate it? Not the people, but hate the condition they're in. And can I let it go? The hurt that has been given to me. Do you remember when Jesus redeemed you? I actually do. It's a very strange thing. I remember being in Great Falls, Montana. Gordon Naylor was the preacher. And I remember being at his house on Friday night. We were staying over with them and going to church on Sunday. And my dad started the conversation. Troy's asked about being baptized, Gordon. It's very strange. I can close my eyes and be at that table. And I can see all of their faces so clearly. And Gordon said, that's wonderful. Do you need to go right now? We can drive up there to the building and I can baptize you right now, he said. And then he said something very strange. But if you can wait, what a blessing it would be to the church. I remember it so profoundly. He said it would really do the heart of the church good to hear your confession offered in faith and to watch you be baptized. And I said, I can wait. And I remember that Sunday morning. I was not very big. I was very little. It seems like a lifetime ago. Do you remember when you received God's grace? Well, can you set a slave free? Can you release someone else who owes you a debt? Can you allow that debt? I know this is impossible. I should not even say these words. Can you allow that to be charged to Jesus? But they didn't ask forgiveness. If he owes you anything, can you allow that to be charged to Jesus? He says, I'll pay you back. I promise. But you owe me your very soul. Forgiveness is a very hard thing, but oh my goodness, what would happen if we released it in our world? Maybe lament would turn to joy. Maybe that's why words of lament, mourning, and woe are sweet. Because they lead to forgiveness. Maybe that's why they taste so good. Could you um, rebuild the walls? Help someone feel safe and loved again? Could you uh, rebuild the temple? 
not the one in Jerusalem. Aren't you the dwelling place of God? Could you help build a temple in someone else? Could you restore the bride of Christ? I know that that task seems impossible, but it is not. This is where our world has gotten a little bit. If we, church, just believe it's impossible, all things are possible for him who believes. Ask anything in my name. Do you remember those words? I know the task seems impossible, but it is not. You are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God, equipped with the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And you can, if you want, you can set the world right. I'm not talking about the big world. I'm talking about just your peace. The world inside you and the world that you are living in connected to someone else. Boy, if you could let the Spirit of God work in that world, that one-on-one -on -one world, imagine if it were to spread. You can, if you want, set the world right. It might not seem huge, but it's so huge, I'm not even supposed to ask you to do it. But imagine if you let God do it. Your world, where you live, with those you know, man, you could light up the darkness. You would shine, not with your own glory, with the glory of the one and only Son of God who came the light of the world in you. And you would release it. Can you imagine? Maybe that's why lament tastes so sweet. Because of the hope it expresses, the salvation of God. If you have never claimed Jesus, and we want to pause and we want to invite you to claim Jesus, to confess before the church that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for your sin, that He was buried, and that three days later He rose from the dead. That if you could confess that and be baptized into Christ's death and raised in His life, you would be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and God would begin to put the world right in you. He would. And if you're a believer and the burden is too great and you need more of God's Spirit and you've released the prayer of the saints to encourage your heart, if you know someone that the church needs to be praying for, whatever your need is this morning, I hope that you will make it known to us so that we can encourage you today. Let's stand together and sing.